Republican skull. I sure hope those hope I sure hope those talks reverberated with our audience as the points you guys make are essential for early companies to understand and embrace. Um, I want to get straight into the questions. Uh, and again, uh, the first one has come from multiple sources uh, as well as myself. And that question is if and, and Dr. Bullock, Julie points this out, if, if the FDA won't stop a drug with mediocre or potentially no benefit from moving along the development cycle, who will? And I'm going to throw that out to Dr. Bullock first, and then here. Great. Um, thanks, Jeff. So, yeah, this is an interesting question because I think a lot of people think that the FDA will tell people if their drug is not you know, um, you know, as efficacious or, or looking as promising as others that they may see on a daily basis. But, you know, the FDA can't surmise or compare against other INDs. It's, it's not in their purview and it's also extremely dangerous. So I think one of the, you know, v venture capital um, in, a, in a minor way sort of have a tendency to tell people whether or not a drug is working or not by either funding it or not funding it. Um, but I can talk a little bit about that as well. So I think that a lot of it, it actually comes down to the onus of the company and, and being real about what they're doing and, and, and whether or not the efficacy that they're seeing is commiserate with other things that are either in the histor historical area uh, as a standard of care or based on what is preliminary coming out of like ASCO, AACR and some of the other major major meetings. Great, thanks, Chris. Do you want to do you want to have any thoughts on that? Um, sure. Yeah. You know, I would just add that uh, I understand it's a very competitive landscape out there. So, getting interactions with FDA is often used by startups as a, a mechanism for fundraising. Um, but getting designations from uh, FDA, uh, even priority review, fast track, orphan drug designation, RMAT. Um, a lot of these things, you know, doesn't necessarily mean, again, that FDA has signed off that this is the best product out there. Um, and so there is a mismatch sometimes between some of the mechanisms used to build value in your company and, and tying that specifically to FDA feedback, even having a pre-IND meeting, for example. And um, I think there's a large gap between the value created for a company that's trying to get into first in human trials, because oftentimes the value of your company will go up quite a bit just getting into clinical trials. But that's quite different from getting a marketing application when the FDA is really looking at both safety and efficacy. And so some things certainly to keep in mind, um, you know, from a business perspective. Thanks. So here's, a, here's another uh, great question. Can, can either of you guys, or both of you, hopefully, you know, share some examples of when it was clear early that that something was going to fail, but they continued until later, and then it failed. And and if you look back, you could see that this wasn't this was going to be unsuccessful. I'm going to let Chris start with that. <laughs> well, that's a it's a great question. Um, I mean, I think in terms of you know sort of the context we're having our discussion today, um, times when I've seen a clinical hold coming pretty far in advance, again, goes to some of the points even, uh, you know, in Julie's presentation as well about incorporating FDA feedback. Um, if you have a meeting with FDA, an interact meeting, a pre-IND meeting, um, that feedback is essential and it's very important to not, um, if you disagree with the feedback you're getting, that does not mean that you'll be able to change FDA's mind later on down the road. And I think that's a common pitfall when FDA has made it clear the types of data they're looking for to support a clinical trial um, and sponsors think perhaps they can generate a little extra data to change FDA's mind, um, you know, I would, I would push my clients to really strongly consider the FDA feedback and try to generate the data that the FDA is asking for. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, so I, I had, you know, it was very early in my consulting career. I was working with a client that was developing a molecule in the hematolo hematology space, and I had just come out of the FDA, so I had, you know, obviously understood a little bit of what was going on in that space, and the client brought me in, and this was just a train wreck all around. I mean, it didn't have great efficacy. It had a terrible drug-drug interaction liability, 
we got this client, you know, went to JP Morgan, got a ton of money, continued on into expansion, went back to JP Morgan the next year, kept getting more money, um, went into phase two, and then also went into more expansion phases. I think they went through three cycles of this. And I probably called it the first time I saw the compound that this drug was not going to go anywhere. But this company went through about three cycles of JP Morgan funding and ended up not getting any better benefit that they had seen out of their early phase one dose escalation, which was a, a very marginal overall response rate. Um, and it just it flabbergasted me that these <laughs> this company kept going to JP Morgan and kept coming back with money. Um, and I guess it, uh, it took about three years before the drug failed phase two and uh, the company then went defunct. Um, but I can't imagine how many patients were spent um, taking this drug and, and money that went into it that just, it, it was, it really opened up my eyes on how, how things can sort of perpetuate for a number of years. Um, and the only thing that really killed it was the, was the failed phase two trial that wasn't better than historical control. Thanks. As you know, many of us are flabbergasted as well, and and have this to have the thing, same thoughts that you do. And and you know we we can't, as you say, proof of hope. The proof of hope can be slim. And you know I can I can question the sourcing of the unicorn urine that they're trying to purify, you know, to use to, to treat cancer with regards to where they're getting their unicorns from. But if that if that product is you know safe we can't say much and you know that and that is the truth to, to some respects so here's here's a question from our audience that's that's way out of my league but um many of the trials these days are global many sponsors consider countries such as australia where the regulations are not as strict as fda would you be able to speak to that chris can address okay, and chris I'll, I'll let julie start and then and then let chris go from there julie yeah so a lot of uh clients will try to go to the FDA and, you know, some of them will state that the FDA won't let the study proceed. And so they'll go to Australia and, um, and Australia will let them proceed. And I think that that's always a, a little bit risky. And I guess that's the companies, you know, however they want to do it. Um, I prefer to go to places like Australia or others because, um, not because the FDA won't let you do something, but because it makes sense from a business perspective. So I always get a little bit nervous when people are telling me they're going to the, the to Australia or other agencies for to avoid kind of loopholes in the FDA system, because I do find that the FDA system is probably one you know next to next to Europe is you know the 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 beacon of of what you're trying to achieve here. Um, I do have a number of, of clients that will use Australia. Um, pre, prior to COVID, they were using it for tax benefits. So there is quite a tax benefit for going to Australia. So that is one reason why people do Australia trials. And then recently, because of COVID, a lot of trials in Australia, as well as New Zealand, are basically picking up the slack from the shutdown phase one centers here in the United States and other global places um, so that they can actually keep their, their development programs on track. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think, you know, as an FDA reviewer, whatever comes through the door at the time of your application has more to do with its applicability to the patient population in the United States. So if you do decide to do a global study, that's something that you always have to keep in the back of your mind is how you're going to, you know, put this study into perspective um, at the time of your application. Interesting. So, so Australia or other jurisdictions are a way to get the drug into people to generate real human safety data to then potentially come back to the FDA and say, you know, your safety considerations have been addressed because we have actually have real human data? Yes. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I was, I was going to say that, that that was all I was going to add is, you know, to the companies out there to not make the assumption um, that going and doing a clinical trial in another country will automatically pave the way. Uh, we get a lot of companies that call us with experience in patients outside the U.S. So again, my advice is to seek out experts with uh, specific experience in working with FDA who, you know, we often do this. We can take your existing clinical data into consideration, but also provide you what type of feedback we would expect you to get from the FDA. It's, it's a very common assumption that getting into any patient anywhere in the world will, uh, will pave the way, and that's not quite the case, you know. 
Great. Th thanks, Chris. So unfortunately, we didn't have much time for questions and answers there, um, and we need to move forward. But once again, I can't thank you guys enough, you know, both you and Julie, Chris, to go boldly go where FDA does not go. Um, and, and I think it, 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 it's helpful for, uh, for, you know, investigators and innovators to understand, you know, we have a lot of limitations on what we can say and, and with regards to product design, development, you know, um, and, and you guys obviously are the, are, the, are the people who can help with that uh, tremendously, and I hope everyone can, can, can grasp that. Um, Lisa, I'm going to turn this back over to you to introduce our, our next speakers.